بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع الذنوبنا وتبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته التيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين وفكن الله وإياكم بعلم وعمل صالح إن شاء الله بذكر الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم أما بعد قال مولانا وإمامنا إمام الرضا عليه الصلاة والسلام يا فاطمة اشفع لي في الجنة فإن لك إن الله شأنا من الشأن اللهم إني أسألك أن تختم لي بالسعادة فلا تسلب مني ما أنا فيه ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أمنا به صدق الإمام عليه السلام Respected scholars, elders, brothers, sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When we turn to the characteristics and the attributes and the fada'il of the holy lady Ma'asuma, buried in the city of Qum, we see that many of her fada'il has been given to her, attributed to her by the a'immat al-mayameen al-athar. You find, for example, the likeness of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam in a lengthy riwayah, profound narration. He says, Ala inna lillahi haraman, wa huwa Mecca. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a haram, has a shrine. And that shrine is located in the holy city of Mecca. He says, Ala inna li rasulillahi haraman. And indeed, the Prophet of Allah has a haram. وَهُوَ الْمَدِينَةِ And that is located in the city of Medina al-Munawwara. It says, عَلَى وَإِنَّ لِأَمِيرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ هَرَمًا Indeed, the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam, has a haram, وَهُوَ الْكُوفَ And that is located in the city of Kufa. عَلَى وَإِنَّ قُمْ الْكُوفَةُ سَغِيرًا It says, indeed, the city of Qum, is what is recognized as a smaller version of Kufa. Ala inna lijannati thamaniyat abwab. It says, indeed, Jannah or the heavens has eight gates. A day of judgment when every single human being will be trialed and judged. The successful ones, the fa'izin or the fa'izun, they will rush towards the kingdom of heaven trying to enter it to seek the reward of bliss and happiness. And so many people will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allocated eight doors to this kingdom of heaven, to the kingdoms of heaven. It says, the heavens has eight doors. مِنْهَا إِلَىٰ قُمْ But three of these eight doors are located from the city of Qum. تقبض فيها امرأة من ولدي اسمها فاطمة بنت موسى بن جعفر عليه السلام أو عليه السلام. It says that these three doors which are located in Qum, the holy lady Fatima Ma'asuma will take her followers and escort them towards the kingdom of heaven. وتدخل بشفاعتها شيعتي الجنة بأجمعهم. And indeed, she will perform the intercession, or she will act as an intercessor for the Shia. Imam Sadiq salam says, for my Shia. And through her intercession, they will enter the kingdoms of heaven. You find, for example, when it comes to the fada'il of the holy lady Fatima, 
They say that she is one of the actors of intercessors or intercession. That on the day of judgment, she will intercede on our behalf, on my behalf, on the behalf of my family, and of course, on behalf of you and your families. That the Shia of Ali Muhammad will enter or will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven through her intercession. And this is, of course, reaffirmed in the ziyarah of Imam al-Radha alayhi salam. What's interesting is that when you look at the, the ziyarah of the holy lady, Hazrat Ma'asuma salamullahi alayha, our scholars have come forward and said that there are two ladies in history whose ziyarat has been affirmed by the Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam One of them is the holy lady, Sayyidat al-Nisa al-Alameen, min al-awwaleen ila akhireen, Fatimat al-Zahra. Salamullahi alayha, and the second is the holy lady Fatima Ma'asuma Salamullahi alayha. As for the ziyarat of, for example, Sakina or Sakina, and for example, the holy lady Zainab Salamullahi alayha, and all of the other famous personalities, women personalities, their ziyarat are organized and affirmed by the scholars of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, except for these two prominent women. And in this ziyarah, which is of course a ziyarah which has been given to us by Imam al-Radha alayhi salam, and of course the historians, they say that Hazrat Ma'asuma, she passes away before the passing away of Imam al-Radha alayhi salam. And when the news reaches him that her sister has passed away, he then contributes and he offers this particular ziyarah for her followers, that whosoever goes towards the lands of Qum, to perform her ziyarah, they should engage in the recitation of this particular ziyarah. And indeed, in this ziyarah, he mentions, he says, Ya Fatima to Ishfi'ali fil Jannah. Perform my shafa'ah, allowing me to enter the kingdom of heaven. فَإِنَّ لَكِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ شَعْنًا مِّنَ الشَّعْنًا And indeed, the reason why I seek your intercession is because you have a sha'an, you have a position in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so in this tonight's discussion, very brief discussion, I want to elaborate and discuss the concept of shafa'a, which is there found within the Qur'an, and as well, a concept which has been expounded by the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam. Shafa'a, when you look at it from a broader perspective, the meaning of shafa'a is, we as human beings are all considered to be sinners. We commit sins. There are some of us who are, for example, addicted to one or a few particular t types of sins. That there doesn't go a day that goes by in our lives that we perform that particular sin. The moment we wake up, we perform that sin. The moment we go to sleep, to end the day, we perform that particular sin. Whatever it may be. You find that because we each and every one of us are sinners... It may be very real for us to leave this world, some of us in the state of sin, some of us who have not had the chance to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Death, of course, just as a reminder, can happen at any time to any single person. A person may not anticipate death, and death can have overpower him. This person may have accumulated burdens of sins, may have his life changed because of the sins that he performs. And all of a sudden, he may leave this world in that particular state without asking forgiveness from Rabb al -Alami. Does that mean that this person has no chance of forgiveness anymore? No. The riwayat as well as the Quran explains to us that the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be seen much more in the hereafter than what is seen in dunya. When you refer to that particular hadith of the infallibles, they say if you were to imagine Allah's rahmah compartmentalized and segmented into a hundred areas or into a hundred pieces, one of those a hundred are seen in dunya. The rest 99 will be seen in akhir on the day of judgment. Allah will distribute his rahmah to his servants such that to such an extent that even shaitan al rajim will feel that he will be forgiven because of the rahmah that will be extended on the day of judgment. But of course the hadith goes on to affirm and reiterate that there is no forgiveness and there is no rahmah for shaitan al rajim so it is very much possible that we as the followers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam, will see forgiveness even on the day of judgment. That Allah will extend and shade us with his rahmah. 
It's very much possible, and the likelihood of it is very much strong. And so it gives us hope that each and every one of us will be able to seek Jannah, the higher levels of Jannah, inshallah. And so those individuals, for example, who has or who have committed small sins in, their, in this life, small sins are the reality which has been expounded by the scholars is that this, the, the, the essence of small sins is that you won't even need to ask for forgiveness for those sins. In fact, your good deeds may delete those good small sins innal hasanat yudhabna as-sayyi'at as the quran says that goodness will take away some of the evil deeds these are the small evil deeds that we perform in our day to day lives as for the kaba'ir the big sins the greater sins imagine if a person was to leave this world without seeking repentance from these greater sins one of the ways in which allah will forgive the greater sins is through the concept of shafa'a when Allah will choose and appoint certain individuals or certain realities to intercede for us on our behalf. On the day of judgment, if I have, for, for example, performed many of the great sins, I will stand in the divine court. I am about to be sentenced. I am about to be punished for my sins. And I deserve these punishments. For every time I violate the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am deserving of punishment. Just as how a person is deserving of punishment when they break the laws of the land. So just as how or just before the sentence is given and delivered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the supreme divine judge, one of the intercessors will step forward and say, Ya Allah, I beg of you that you forgive him for his sins. And Allah will say it is through you and your dignity and your nobility that I will forgive this person. It is through my love for you, I will forgive this person from his kaba'a, from his greater sins. And slowly we will see the uqubah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be transferred into love and mercy and forgiveness. So this is the reality of shafa'a, that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will share his mercy through certain personalities. Now there's a very interesting discussion. When you look at, for example, the concept of shafa'a that has been established within the Holy Qur'an, you'll find that within the different denominations amongst the Muslims, the different sects amongst the Muslimin, there are those who believe that shafa'a is absolutely forbidden, in the sense that it is seen as shirk. Whereas there are those who believe that shafa'a is perfectly normal, and it is part and parcel within the essence of the religion of Islam. The Salafis, for example, they come forward and they say that the concept of shafa'a that is believed by the other sects within the Muslim Ummah is on the same par as shirk. And they explain this very clearly. They say there are two types of shafa'a. The first type of shafa'a is when I turn to Allah and I say, Ya Allah, through your might and your glory and your essence and your divinity, I ask you to intercede for me and to forgive my sins. It is through you that I intercede. They say this form of shafa'a is perfectly normal and it's fine. You see, there is a second type of shafa'a. When, when I come towards holy personalities like the Prophet, and I say, Ya Muhammad al-Rasulullah, ishfi'li fil jannah, for example. I want you, Ya Rasulullah, to intercede for me. They say that when you turn to an individual for shafa'a, this is seen as shirk. Because only Allah is the one who intercedes. Not the Prophet of Allah, not the Aimma, not for example any other person outside of these, not the Anbiya for example. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is their reason behind this? They say there are three evidences behind this. The first evidence is found, for example, in the Holy Quran. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدَ Shafa'a is the same as dua and seeking dua. When I seek dua, I seek dua from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have certain hajats, I have certain needs. I turn to Allah and ask Him for, his, for my needs. The eye of the Holy Quran is clear. فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا When you recite your dua, when you supplicate, supplicate to Him and Him only. Do not go to individuals in the community, for example, and seek your dua from them. It doesn't work that way. Allah is the only one who should be sought from. 
Your du'as are exclusive to him. The moment you start reciting your du'as to others, it becomes shirk. They say that du'a and shafa'a is one in the same. Shafa'a is a form of du'a, is one of the manifestations of du'a. So this is the first evidence. The Qur'an vehemently goes against the concept of shafa'a because shafa'a is exclusive for Allah. Number one. Number two, it says the Qur'an testifies that the mushrikeen of Mecca, that the Quraysh of Mecca, the idol worshippers, they are labeled as kuffar in the Holy Qur'an. And look what the eye of the Holy Quran says with regards to them. وَيَعْبَدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَذُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ And they used to go around and they used to worship idols. These idols did not benefit them, nor did it cause harm to them. This was the power of the idols. It brings about no benefit, it brings about no harm. وَيُقُولُونَ هَا أُولَاءِ شُفَعَاءُنَا إِنَّ اللَّهِ And they used to say that these idols will intercede for us on the day of judgment. The idea behind this is that anyone who turns to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this case the idols for example, it has no benefit for that human being in this world. That this person should exclusively turn to Allah and Allah alone. So this was the second evidence. The third evidence was that only Allah is capable of interceding or performing shafa'a on the day of judgment. You find, for example, Kullillahi shafa'atu jami'an. Say that indeed for Allah is shafa'a for every single human being in the, in the world. The ayah is sarih, it's wadi, it's clear. There is no level of ambiguity in this particular verse. مَا لَكُمْ مِن دُونِهِ مِنْ وَلِيٌّ وَلَا شَفِيعٌ O human being, there is no wali for you and there is no shafi' for you. أَفَلَا تَدَذَكَّرُونَ Do you not then understand that Allah is the source of shafa? So these were the three evidences that were provided by the Salafiyun, by the Wahhabiyun, to prove that shafa from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on the same par as shirk. Our reply is very simple. We say, number one, when you examine that dua and shafa'a, or shafa'a is one of the manifestations of dua, it is not wrong to seek dua from another human being. And this is how the system works. The system of this world works in this way. If I have a particular need, for example, I am in need of financial help, I'll turn to a person who is kareem, who is jawad in the community. Now you will seek financial help from them. Yes, it's beneficial when I turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost. But this world is a world of cause and effect. And I should turn to someone who is able to meet my needs. That on the one hand I turn to Allah. But Allah has given me aqab to turn to someone who is able to provide me sustenance. Who is able to, for example, release me from my problems and my issues. To find and provide for me solutions. Yeah, for example, there's a hadith of the Holy Prophet of Islam. He says that when you, for example, come across a person, Yunadi al Munadi, he cries out for help, and you, as a Muslim, you hear his cries and you hear his help, and you refuse to help him, you are no longer a Muslim. Someone who is identified as the follower of Rasulullah. And the discussion is deep. Within this discussion, you bring in the opinions of Fakhruddin al Razi. Rahmatullah alayhi and Khawarizmi and his tafasir, for example. And many of the different ulama from amongst the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they refuse this particular argument. That dua, that shafa'ah is one of the manifestations of dua exclusive for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because within this world, within this system that Allah has organized for us, we also seek dua from others as well. Not just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the people, but from the people around us as well. Number two, when they came forward and they said that the mushrikeen of Mecca used to believe that their idols used to be shufa, or shufa, or they used to believe that these idols would intercede for them in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah labels them as kuffar. Our response to that is there is a difference between believing. A person being a shafi, a person being a source of intercession, and that person being worshipped. These are two very distinct ideas that need to be separated from one with the other. When I turn to Allah, I worship Allah alone. 
When I stand in front of the dhari of Rasulullah, for example, in the city of Medina, and I say to him, Ya Rasulullah, provide shafa'a for me, it's not with the intention that I worship him. And of course, this suffices for our answer. The third, they say, as in the idea behind this was the Quraysh of Mecca, they used to believe that not only were the idols shafi or shufa'a that they would provide intercession, but they used to worship these idols. It's okay for me to believe that the Rasulullah will provide shafa'a, but it's another thing when I go ahead and I worship Rasulullah, which is not what we do. We worship Allah, but we believe that Allah has given Rasulullah the power of shafa'a as well. The third answer, when they came forward and they said that the ayat of the Holy Quran are clear. Uh, that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the authority of shafa'a for every single human being in this world. We say sahih, but there are ayats of the Holy Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he shares this power of shafa'a to others as well. For example, in Ayat Al-Qursi, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِثْنِ That there are certain personalities who will have the power of shafa'a, whom Allah is blessed or pleased with. وَلَا تَنْفَعُ شَفَاعَتُهُ إِنْدَهُ إِلَّا لِمَنْ عَذِنَ لَهُ That no one will benefit from shafa'a except from those Allah has given the power of shafa'a from or to. These specific individuals, we will seek shafa'a from them. Now, Before going to the discussion as to who these individuals are, it is necessary to mention that there are certain types of people in this world, there is no shafa'a for them whatsoever. Like whom? You find, for example, according to the riwayat, they say a sultan of zalim, number one, will see no shafa'a on the day of judgment. Shafa'a is a manifestation of Allah's mercy of Allah's compassion towards his creation. But when you have a king, an authority, zalim from amongst the zalimin, an oppressor who fueled his own power and might in this world, he will see no shafa'a on the day of judgment. Number two, maghalif al deen a person who is responsible for ghulu and ghului beliefs, that he exaggerates in many areas of his belief. For example, as I mentioned, a person who believes that the Holy Prophet of Islam is worthy of worship. In the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, there were those who used to worship him as a god, as a deity. There are those who used to see Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam as a lord, as a deity as well. Upon which the Imam curses them. The A'immat al-Athar curse them because of their exaggerated beliefs. For these individuals, there is no shafa. Number three, a nasibi, the one who has hatred towards the Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as -salam. The Khawarij, for example, and the hatred they had towards the Ahl al-Bayt, they will see no shafa on the Day of Judgment. As in, imagine a person who believes that, even today, or for example, if you look at some of the discussions held online by individuals sitting in London, for example, they say that Abba Abdullah alayhi salam, when he stood against Yazid ibn Muawiyah, he was wrong in what he did. And he deserved what happened to him. Imagine such ludicrous words, blasphemous words. Imagine a heart where they embrace the authority of Yazid ibn Muawiyah and they criticize the movement of Abi Abdullah alayhi salam. For these individuals, a nasibi, a person who has hatred towards the Ahl al-Bayt, there is no shafa'a for them. Then the one who will see no shafa'a on the day of judgment is the one who does not believe with the essence of shafa'a. One of the criteria for a person to gain and be a recipient of shafa'a is that they have to believe in it. Then the one who insults the Ahl al-Bayt, for example, he will see no shafa'a. According to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, the one who belittles, the belittles his salah, he will not see shafa'a on the day of judgment as well. Belittles his uh, salah. Istighfaf, as they say it in the riwayat. A person who not just neglects his salah, a person who belittles, delays his salah, a person who gives no importance to his salah in his daily life, for him he will see no shafa on the day of judgment. A person who, for example, consumes intoxicants, 
A person who consumes wine and beer and all of these different types of intoxications that we have, they will see no shafa on the day of judgment. And now coming to the final area of our discussion, who are the intercessors on the day of judgment? Number one, you have the prophet of Islam, who is the greatest intercessor on the day of judgment. Asa yab'athaka rabbuka maqamam mahmood, as the Quran says. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given and delivered to the Holy Prophet a noble position, a maqam mahmood, a praised worthy position. Fakhruddin al-Razi, in his tafsir, tafsir al-kabir, he says there is no doubt that this maqam is the maqam of shafa'ah. That every single being in this world will see and seek intercession from the Prophet. From the angels to the anbiya, to the human beings, every single creation will seek shafa'a from the Holy Prophet of Islam. The second form of shafa'a, or the second intercessor, a shafi on the Day of Judgment, will be the Quran. The more, the stronger our relationship with the Holy Quran, the better our position on the Day of Judgment. Because the Quran will intercede for us. Imagine a sinner who is on the verge of being uh, sentenced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala His good deeds manifested in Qira'at al-Quran Understanding the verses of the Quran It will manifest itself as a physical form Will stand in before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And say to him, Ya Allah, I intercede for this person Because of the close relationship that he had with me The Quran will say the Qur'an will manifest itself in a beautiful figure that will aid this person in the hereafter. Therefore, we should try and remind ourselves to strengthen our relationship with the Qur'an through qara'ah, through understanding its tafsir, and so on and so forth. To try and apply the practical uh, advices of the Qur'an within our lives. The third are the scholars. The scholars... They will intercede on behalf of the people that they try to guide in this life. On the Day of Judgment, scholars will have the opportunity to stand forward and intercede on behalf of the believers. Number five, you find, for example, the shuhada. The shuhada will be able to intercede for the people as well. According to some narrations, it's mentioned that the shuhada will have the ability to intercede for 70 individuals. All of those who have given their lives for their religion, Allah will bless them with the maqam of shafa, as a shafi on the day of judgment. Number six, the angels. The angels will uh, intercede on behalf of the believers. According to some narrations, even within the books of our brothers, the Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah, they say that Jibra'il will intercede. On behalf of the believers. Mikael will intercede on behalf of the believers as well. The angels, they will see the believers who are in need of help. And they will beg to Allah to forgive your sins. You find, for example, the believers will also have the power of intercession. Those who adhere to the values of taqwa in this life, Allah will give them the power of shafa. Then you have, for example... The miscarried fetus. There are many families, there are many, for example, couples in our communities who have been traumatized having lost a fetus, having miscarried when they try to have children, but they unfortunately are not able to deliver that child. They say on the day of judgment, this child will stand on the gates of heaven and they will cry and they will wait for their parents to enter the kingdom of heaven first. And they will intercede on behalf of their parents. Ya Allah, these are my parents. Forgive them from their sins and let them enter the kingdom of heaven. The miscarried fetuses will intercede on behalf of their parents on the day of judgment. Then you have, you know, there's a very interesting question. They say when you look at, for example, the Aimmat al adhar and when you look at, for example, the Anbiya, and amongst them the final prophets, the seal of the prophet, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alih, why did Allah give them the position of shafa'ah, the maqam of shafa'ah? 
the answer that was given by the scholars is a beautiful answer. They said when you look at, for example, the Anbiya, when you look at, for example, the A'immat al-Athar, when you look at, for example, the Urafa, when they used to worship Allah, they worshipped Allah because they recognized that Allah deserves to be worshipped. They did not want heaven, nor did they want to be protected from the fires of hell. Their worship was to bring people close to Allah. Their purpose in life was not to uh, reserve a maqam in Jannah. It was to seek proximity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they tried to bring people towards Allah as much as they could during their time in their life. In this dunya. How can you go about rewarding such a person? Imagine how can you reward a person who does not yearn for the pleasures of Jannah. Who does not yearn protection from the fires of hell. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them. Allah rewards them by being one of the doors of Jannah. So that they can intercede on behalf of the Mu'mineen and the Muslimin on the day of judgment. Then you have the final intercessor who is none other than the Lady Fatima Ma'asuma. The Holy Lady Fatima Ma'asuma, she is no doubt considered to be one of the doors of Jannah. As the Hadith says, three doors of Jannah will come and emanate from Qum itself out of the eight doors. They say one day Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi, the Sahib, Sahib Mafatih al-Jinan, one day had a, he has a dream. In his dream he sees Mirza Qummi, Ayatollah Mirza Qummi, or Muhakkik al-Qummi. When he sees Muhakkik al-Qummi in his dream, they have a discussion. Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi says to him, he says, Ya Muhakkik al-Qummi, tell me, is the holy lady Fatima Ma'asumma indeed an intercessor for the Mu'mineen, the Muslimin? Muhakkak al-Qummi, he replies, he says that I am the Shafi'ah for the people of Qum. Huh? He was referring to the people of Qum specifically. He says, I am the one who provides intercession for the people of Qum. The holy lady Fatima Ma'asumma, she provides intercession for the whole of the Mu'mineen of the whole of the world. Not just the people of Qum. She is a Shafi'ah for all of the Mu'mineen and the Muslimin. When you refer to, for example, the stories of the late Ayatollah Shahabuddin al-Mar'ashi al-Najafi, there's a beautiful story. He says, and we spoke about this last night, he migrates to the city of Qum because of the dream of his father. When he migrates to the city of Qum, they say one day a proposal came towards his daughter. Now his students, who are alive today in Qum, narrate this story. His students say, the Alawi, he comes forward, he says that my teacher, Shahab al-Din al-Mar'ashi al-Najafi, they say that he was poor. And he used to live in a state of poverty. Throughout his stay in Qum, for 35, 35 times he moved from one property to another. Because when you stay in one property, it inflates, the value inflates. A jara becomes more, so he had to move from one property to another. 35 times, he moves from one property to another. He says that because he was living in a state of poverty, a proposal came towards his daughter. Now in Qom, there's a tradition that yes, the mahar is given by the husband or the groom-to-be, or the groom or the husband-to-be. He provides the mahar, but as far as the furniture of the house is concerned, all of that is to be paid by the wife. The mahar comes from the husband as dictated by the sharia, but the mahar, but the expenses of all of the furniture comes from the woman's side as dictated by the culture of Iran. He says, now a proposal has come to my daughter, but I have no money to provide any furniture for her house. So he goes running to the holy shrine and he begs the holy lady Ma'asuma. He begins to cry and cry and cry. He says, Ya Hazrat Ma'asuma, why is it that I am poor, unable to meet the needs of my daughter? Because of my financial capacity, she won't be able to marry. And he cries and he cries and he cries. He goes home and he goes to sleep. In his dream, he hears a knock on his door. He opens the door and there was a man. A man says, go to the haram right now. 
the holy lady Fatima Ma'asuma wants to see you. And he goes running towards the haram. When he goes towards the haram, he goes to this particular uh, sahn al dhahabiyah he goes to that sahan, and he sees the holy lady there. And he knows that it's her. Because she, being the daughter of Imam Al-Qadim alayhi salam, and Ayatollah Mar'ash being from the lineage, a Musawi, from the lineage of Imam Al-Qadim, he knew that this woman was her great aunt. He comes towards her. He proceeds towards her. She looks at him. She says, Ya Shahab, Ya Shahab al-Din, what have I done to you for you to question me this way? Hmm? Why is it that you speak to me in this way as if I've done nothing for you? Ya Shahab al-Din, are you tired of me? Have you lost faith in me? Do you not trust me anymore? He begins to cry. The tears flow from his face. He says, Ya Shahab al-Din, the moment you walked into my city and you moved into my city, you have been under my riayah. You have been under my care and my protection. Do not lose hope in me now. Now is the time that you refer to me and you have hope in me. At this moment, he wakes up. When he wakes up, he goes to the haram crying to seek forgiveness from the holy lady, Fatima Ma'asuma. He goes into the haram, he begins reciting his salah. After he finishes his salah, one man approaches him and he says, O oh, Grand Ayatollah al marashi al Najafi, this is some money for you. He gives him an envelope of money. The Ayatollah looks at him and he says, What money is this? Is this khums? He says, No, it's not khums. He says, Is this zakat? He says, No, it's not zakat. He says, What is it? Sadaqa? He says, No, it's not sadaqa. He says, this is a hadiyah, it's a gift for you. Ayatollah Marashi thanks him, he places the money in his pocket, he goes home, and he gives the envelope to his daughter. He says, use this money to buy your athath, your furniture. The woman, the wife, or his daughter, she goes and she begins to buy the furniture. She buys and buys and buys, and the money does not end. The man that gave hadiyah to Ayatollah Marashi Najafi gave him so much, that it was able to fulfill all of his daughter's needs. And he says that this is just one of the miracles that I saw from the holy lady Ma'asuma whilst I stayed there in Qum. But there are many more. You find that she is Karimati Ahl al-Bayt. That she is the one who provides Karama. She provides miracles for her followers. And tonight is her night. Today is her day. These are her nights. And we say to her, Ya Hazrat Ma'asuma, you died in the lands of Qum, Gharib, far from all of her family, far from your families, far from your friends, far from your city, just as how your father was buried in Qadimiyya, far from all of the other A'immat al-Adhar. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far al kadim they say she was only 10 years old before when his father was assassinated. Imam al qadim for the majority of his life, he was in prison. Until in that moment, the Abbasid Caliph makes a decision to poison him. He administ administers the poison. Imam al qadim alayhi salam consumes the poison in prison and he begins to cough up. Blood. He begins to cough his internal. And you found that sooner or later he passes away in prison. The Abbasid Caliph, they don't stop there. What do they do? They take his body in the middle of the night and they take it out into the streets of Baghdad and they hang it on the bridge of Baghdad. The people wake up in the morning and they see the body of Imam al Qadim hung in the middle of the bridge of Baghdad. There were those who did not know who this body belonged to. But there were those who didn't know who this body belonged to. And they began to perform the aza of Imam al-Qadim alayhi salam. They saw his body in the middle of the bridge of Baghdad. No one knows whether his body was covered or it was uncovered for the public to see. His body was hung in the bridge of Baghdad for three days, humiliated in public. This is how the Ahl al-Bayt were treated. 
She was 10 years of age when her father was taken away from her. And then she was now raised by her brother, Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. When we turn our minds towards what happened on the 10th of Muharram, they say that when the battle finished, the wife of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn turns to one of her servants and she says to her, go and take this sheet and cover the body of my husband, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. Take this cloth and provide cover for my husband. The servant, what does he do? He runs into the sands of Karbala until he finds the body of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. When he comes towards the body of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, he is about to place the cover on his body. When he raises his head and he sees the body of Abi Abdullah alayhi salam, he then comes back towards the tents. His wife, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn's wife, approaches him. He says, oh my servant, have you covered the body of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn? The servant replies, he says, no, I could not cover the body of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. She says, why is it that you did not cover the body of Zuhair? And the servant replies, he says, how can I cover the body of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn when the body of Abi Abdullah alayhi salam is laid bare in the sands of Karbala? He says, I took the cloth and I went towards the body of Abi Abdullah and I covered his body. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon Sayalamu alladheena zalamu ayya min qalabin yankalibun Wa akhri da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Surat al-Mubarakat al-Fatiha For all our marhumeen insha'Allah Surat al-Fatiha